Yes. Protein synthesis is kind of the, the yes, it's kind of the pain. But it's not it's the entire process of managing, packaging, and distributing proteins. Right, so you're right, I would say. Starts off in the nucleus, nucleus produces the RNA, releases the RNA into the cytoplasm. Sweet. Cyto in the cytoplasm, ribosome jumps on, these, on, on the RNA, right? If there is the right signal code, which is at the very beginning of the protein, if, say, it's mucin and it's going to be secreted, recognition particle grabs a hold of it, carries it to the ER, and then binds it to the ER. On the ER, it can either become woven into the membrane or go through in, into the lumen. Once inside the lumen, then, it may pinch off, right? And Oh, this is my AMP2. All right. Once that happens, it may pinch off like this, and we now have a vesicle with a piece of polypeptide in it, right? A polypeptide. Not a functional protein yet. And isn't that where we left off? Right. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing that endomembrane system is because it allows you to uh, connect nuclei smooth and rough ER, ribosomes, RNA, which isn't an, an organelle, but it's there, the endoplasmic reticulum, vesicles, and coming up next, what we're going to start with, and that first thing we're going to start with now is the Golgi, right? Isn't that where we left off? Yes. I've been pretty good at keeping both classes at about the same rate, which is, which is actually kind of difficult. There's rough ribosomes, right? And if it buds off, we now have a transport vesicle. And remember, what is a vesicle? Is that really anything specific? No. no. It's just like a bubble. It's a membrane bubble. And always remember, membrane is membrane is membrane, which means you can add it together and take it apart, and it's almost identical. Maybe a little bit of protein difference because of where it occurs in the pathway, right? But nonetheless, the core part of the membrane is about the same. Now, the next step after we create this transport vesicle is leading off to what's called the Golgi. And now, if we were talking about a car, we'd call these people the detailers, right? They'd put on the pinstriping, maybe hang the mirrors, uh, put in the floor mats, put in the radio, maybe put on the tires, and then fill the tank with gas. Right? You'd recognize the thing before they started, but it wouldn't run, would they? The car would not run before these people got a hold of it. As soon as they finish off the job, now we've got a nice functional car. Same thing here. The Golgi's first job is modification of proteins. So it receives those vesicles that butted off the rough ER. So what is it made of? Stacks of memory. Right? And since membrane is membrane is membrane, that vesicle carrying that piece of protein, or at least at this point still just a polypeptide, finds the Golgi and fuses to it and they fuse together. And whatever's in the vesicle is now inside the Golgi, or at least inside the first layer of the Golgi. All right. So once that happens, now they start to modify it. They may turn pieces on, they might cut some pieces off, they might strap, you know, slap on some carbohydrates, they might slap on a couple of methanes, or at least methyl groups. They might do some folding, so that when that protein is done in the Golgi, it is now a fully functional protein. 
it would be a fully functional, since the example I always give is mucus, the protein of mucus is mucin. By the time it got out of the Golgi, it would be fully ready to act as a component of mucus. All it needs now is a little bit of water. <clears throat> so, there's also a little bit of polysaccharide synthesis that goes on because a lot of times they are, there are some, um, they talk about glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are proteins with sugars added. And these are some huge molecules. Some of the, uh, some of the ground substance that we find in connective tissue are enormous, massive. These core of protein with, looks like a porcupine with carbohydrates stuck around the outside. Okay, so that might be part of what's going on at the app Golgi. But remember, it's receiving, modification, storage, and then shipping of those molecules. It's sort of like FedEx, right? No, but FedEx doesn't really modify unless they start kicking your, your boxes around. They're, they're not positively modifying them. They might modify them negatively, but anyway. I shouldn't say that. They, they basically hired half of my students. When I taught down in Louisville, FedEx's headquarters was in Louisville. They all landed right over a buddy of mine's house. All the 747s were about 100 feet above his roof. Anyway, here's the Golgi. We call the, the, the sacs inside, there we, saw, we call them cisternae again, just like we did with the, the ER, right? Oops, jump ahead. My mouse is alive. All right, so. The entry face we call the cis face. The exit face is the trans face. So basically, as the vesicle fuses to this side, it'll butt off and fuse to the next one, which will butt off and fuse to the next one, which will butt off and fuse to the next one, and then it's released. By this point, the enzymes in the Golgi have already modified the, the protein on the inside enough so that it's now functional. Okay? And just like the protein has an identifying signal that tells that it's supposed to go to the ER. <coughs> Once it's released from the Golgi, that vesicle knows where it's supposed to go to. And it's based on what's inside, right? I mean, isn't that, you know, you get groceries, you bring them home, you look in the bag, oh, this one's got, this one's got refrigerator food, so you, you take it, oh, this one's got canned stuff, so you put it in the, in the pantry. Oh, this one's got paper stuff, so you put it with the paper stuff. Kind of what happens here. Whatever that protein is, it's going to have a particular location, and the Golgi knows which way to send it, and off it goes. Can you explain what the cisternae are? Cisternae are simply sacs of the, the Golgi. So it's just it's like stacks of, of these bags of membrane. What do they do? Um, each one contains enzymes that would modify those proteins. So it's kind of like if you came in and the back row is the, the cis side. You'd sit down and work for a little bit, all of a sudden you'd move to the next shelf, next, move to the next table, then move to the next table, then move to the next table. All the while you're being modified by, by me. And, no, um, and finally you get to this side, you butt off this side, as soon as you butt off this side, then you leave. Okay? So it's just a constant, it's like a step by step by step process as these things are easing through. Okay? So, structurally speaking, it's really not easy to tell this from the ER. So that's why I like the color-coded ones. There really is not that, I mean, it's all membrane, really. Now, let me ask you a question. If the Golgi is kind of one of the final states of modification for proteins, you kind of get the idea that if a cell is going to be producing a lot of proteins, they're going to have a large Golgi. On the other hand, if a cell does not make many proteins for se uh, secretion, it will only have a small Golgi. Like things like mu uh, muscle cells. A lot of proteins, but they're kept inside. So they're not necessarily going to be secreted or become parts of membranes. All right, so they wouldn't need a large Golgi. Few ribosomes and not a large Golgi. You get the idea. What if you're a gland cell that's producing all kinds of, you know, uh, secretions? then you probably need a rather large Golgi, right? Again, it's just form and function. If you need it, you'll have a large one. If you don't need it, it'll be small. All right, so far so good? All right, so here we are. This is, a, the, this is sort of a summary so far. The nucleus produces the RNA. Here's the ER. 
And once the uh, ribosome binds to the ER, puts the polypeptide into the, vet, vet, into the lumen, which buds off, fuses with the Golgi, passes through, passes through, passes through, buds off, and now we have this final vesicle. And again, like I said, the purpose of that vesicle is determined by its content. Just like anything else, right? You look inside the box, you find out what's inside there, you put it where it's supposed to go. Same thing here. What we're gonna look at now is the number of destinations where that vesicle can go. At this point, those, those proteins inside of there are pretty functional. All right. The first and most important of the vesicles at this point are called lysosomes. To lyse in terms of cells means to disrupt. So a lysosome is a disrupting body. It's a little package of digestive enzymes, which is pretty cool. Now, do, I mean, this is not the same digestive stuff as that which we have in our digestive tract. In that situation, that would be excreted, sorry, that would be secreted. The pancreas would create a lot of it and secrete it into the lumen. We have some digestive enzymes in our saliva. Okay, and again, every time you mix it with food, it starts to break down the chemicals. This would not be the same thing. Yeah? Absorbing is secreting, right? Absorbing, taking in, secreting is giving off for a purpose. Excreting is what you'd refer to as waste. All right, so excreting and secreting, are, I made the mistake of confusing those two. So um, excretion is a process of giving away waste. Secretion is like what glands do. What they give off is given off for a purpose. Like a, like a goblet cell secretes mucus, okay? Actually, it secretes mucin and mixed with water becomes mucus. All right, so what is a lysosome? It's simply a little bubble of membrane that contains digestive enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes. Like I said, it always sounds so magical. Ooh, hydrolytic. What does that mean? It's simply an enzyme that takes a, a polymer, adds a molecule of water, splits, breaks it down into, into, into its individual pieces. Now, how do we use it inside of a cell? Well, let's say a, a cell takes in a, a particle of food. This is actually called, if it's small enough, it's called endocytosis. If it's large, it's called phagocytosis. <laughs> it's easy for you to say. Phagocytosis. Have you ever seen the blob from the 1950s? The blob would eat by phagocytosis. It would engulf. Well, the blob would also take your car, your dog, your neighbor's house, you know, half the town, and it would just kind of ooze and engulf. That's what cells do. If it's big enough, it will engulf enough so that it will wrap membrane around the particle and take it in, and now we've got what's called a food vacuole, which is basically a vesicle containing a food a little pellet of food, whatever that food happened to be. So, we have particle food, we've got lysosome containing enzy uh, digestive enzymes. But when you take two membrane, two vesicles, and put them together, they actually fuse. And that happens and it becomes one bubble, just like this. But since those little enzymes are now in with that particle of food, the enzymes will digest that piece of food and the cell can then use those, use those molecules for whatever they need, okay? You can also do something called autophagy. Sounds like phagocytosis, right? It means same idea, but auto means self, right? This means digesting yourself. Why would you want to digest yourself? Well, recycling used parts. Let's say you've got something like a mitochondria and that's broken down. You simply take that mitochondria, combine it with a lysosome, and you can recycle the parts and reuse them. Okay? So, that's one of the two possibilities. There's one neat trick to this though. Don't they sound kind of dangerous? How would you like to walk around with a little capsule full of sulfuric acid in your pocket? 
How safe would that sound? Wouldn't that seem rather scary? Would you want to walk around with a little capsule of sulfuric acid in your pocket? I wouldn't. So, there, you have to include something that makes it safer. They have a fail-safe. Their fail-safe is their pH. They can only function, the enzymes can only function at a pH of 5. Well, guess what? It's 5 on the inside here, it's 7 out here. What happens if this accidentally empties? They don't function. It's a fail safe. They don't work. It's kind of like having a refrigerator. Most path pathogen bacteria only function at room temperature or body temperature. So if you put them in a colder state, they slow down. All right, so this prevents them from functioning when they're not supposed to. Because they're small enough, when they combine with other vesicles, they can keep the pH low enough to work. Okay, see how that works? However, let's just say, hmm, what if we had 1,000 lysosomes? And they all went at the same time. Now what happens? What's that? They all, all the lysosomes burst. And by the way, that's what they're called, burst lysosomes. What do you suppose would happen? They would digest itself, exactly. And that's why we do not have webbing. Right here, 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 between our toes. Because during development, those cells actually have a programmed cell death. It's called apoptosis, where they are supposed to die at a certain time, right before we're born. And those cells digest themselves. It's planned. We have a lot of cells that have planned death. They only have a certain amount of lifespan, and they die. So um, that's when you'd see a, a cell with a bunch of lysosomes, as if they were designed or getting ready to do themselves in. Okay, so here's phagocytosis, and we're going to talk more about phagocytosis in chapter 7 when we look at the membranes. But in comes the vacuole, in comes the lysosome, lysosome and the vacuole combine. The enzymes now digest the food, and the food becomes usable. Autophagy, same idea, but you start with pre-existing ves uh, ves vesicles instead of vacuoles. Lysosome combines with it dumps its content into that vesicle, digests the parts, and now you can recycle. So that's one of the, that's one of the more common endpoints of an enzyme, sorry, of a, of a uh, vesicle from the endomembrane system. Another one is what's called a vacuole. <clears throat> now, vacuoles are basically primitive in their structure, not by function, but they would look like an empty bubble. They would be big enough that you could see them, but there'd be nothing inside of them that we could see clearly. Now, a couple different kinds of vacuoles are one I've already mentioned, a food vacuole. Food vacuoles are caused by, um, by phagocytosis, where a cell goes up, engulfs a food particle, and that membrane then buds off and it's now carried around inside the cell in this little compartment. Our, we have cells that do that. We, our macrophages will do that to anything they don't recognize. Bacteria, viruses, pieces of wood, you know, if you get like a little sliver, a little debris, they'll go in there and clean up your injury by phagocytizing anything that doesn't look normal. Okay? Now, those are pretty, that's pretty generic, right? I mean, all you have to do is go back and look and say, okay, this is how you form a food vacuole. The other kind here, contractile vacuoles, are pretty neat. From the name, you know, it contracts, so it's going to get smaller. But what does it actually do? It's a pump. Now, take a look at this. This is a paramecium. We're going to see a version of this when we look at them, use the microscopes, and I believe that's this week, isn't it, in lab? But now, remember chemistry? Diffusion, diffusion, things will spread out, molecules will spread out, right? Well, water does the same thing. Water wants to spread out. Water wants to go where it is more concentrated, meaning it wants to move to a place where it can dilute the surrounding material. 
So in the case of a cell like this, if you put this cell in fresh water, what's going to happen? The water is going to want to go into that cell and dilute it, right? Now, if we waited long enough, what's going to happen to that cell? It's going to pop, right? You put a cell in fresh water, it's going to swell until it pops. How many of you have ever seen your hands get wrinkly when you keep them in, in water? That's because the outer cells are starting to swell. The under cells aren't because you have a waterproof barrier. And as they begin to push their way out, you get rippling in your skin like this. Because that's what's happening. Now, up here, you see that vacuole pretty full. It's collecting the extra water. It collects the extra water, collects the extra water, all of a sudden it goes, pumps it out, goes back to normal, and now that cell has just gotten rid of any extra fluid, and it's not going to explode. Kind of like our kidneys and our bladder. Except here, this is doing, this is just getting rid of extra water. Our bladder does the same thing. Only in, in the meantime, we also get, a, get rid of nitrogenous waste, bilirubin, um, any excess hydrogen ions, sodium, anything that's extra, we also pack into urine as well. Okay? But that's really what part of the urinary system is, is to, is to work on fluid balance. So really, that is, has the same function. It's called a contractile vacuole. Now, unfortunately, they move too quickly, and uh, we don't often see them functioning. But you ever see one under a mic, or if you see one, there's some video you can see online. Um, you can kind of come across them occasionally. And they're real fast. They'll swell, and all of a sudden they just go back to that star shape. You don't see, like, puffs of water shooting out of them or anything like that. But it's basically what they do. They just swell and then shrink back down to that star pattern. All right? So that is a contractile vacuole. There's another type of vacuole. And let me just... just let me just jump back. Oops. Let me just jump back here to that, that model plant cell that I started with way back here. There it is. This is what I'm talking about: a central vacuole. Not real exciting, is it? Just empty space. However, they do take on some pretty interesting characteristics. Now, first of all, you know where it is, and as the name implies, it's a central vacuole, so it's right in the middle. It acts like a, well, they say a cell within a cell because it's surrounded by membrane, which means the plant can put stuff in there and isolate it from the rest of the cell. Kind of like a refrigerator or a freezer. You can, you can isolate a very cold environment in a room that's relatively normal. Now, this isn't their refrigerator, but what it is, it's a membrane-bound space, and it can be used as storage. What does it store? Things like wastes. So instead of storing up this in the, in the cytoplasm, they store it up in the central vacuole. You can store up ion, um, ions. You can store up or large organic molecules like proteins and things like that. You can store up all kinds of stuff so that you don't have to waste space in your cytoplasm. You can also use it for protection. You can store up toxins. Anybody know a plant that might do this? It's a very common plant in Minnesota. It's a favorite food of the monarch butterfly. Milkweed? Milkweed. Yep. Milkweed. It stores up toxins. It keeps animals from eating it, except <coughs> now the uh, monarch butterfly is immune to it, so their caterpillars just love milkweed. In fact, the monarch butterfly takes on the toxin from the milkweed and uses it as its own defense. So much so that I once saw a videotape of a blue jay. It was a juvenile blue jay being fed a monarch butterfly caterpillar. And this bird was all kinds of happy. It was like, oh, I get a caterpillar, I get a caterpillar. And they hand this thing, and it's, you can just tell. It's all perky, and it just snaps this thing up, and all of a sudden it's like... And out comes the caterpillar with accuracy and distance. <laughs> And this bird looked like it had the worst case of food poisoning you've ever had. If you've ever had food poisoning, you know what I'm talking about. The thought of eating anything would be just below setting yourself on fire. I mean, you feel sick. And this bird just hurled, it just, it was, it was violent. They try feeding it another caterpillar and the bird goes, sorry, I, I'm, I'm good. 
And it literally would move down its branch, like the, the, the thing it was standing on. It would literally move away from them as they're handing it food. It's like, they're like, I'm, I'm good. I, I ate on the way. I, I had a sandwich outside. I just, I'm good. You know? But, and the funny thing is, let's get even deeper. You try to feed a blue jay a viceroy it looks just like a monarch, but not toxic, and it does the same thing. So, starting with a plant vacuole, we've now created a very interesting relationship between monarch butterflies, viceroys, and blue jays. So, they have a big they have a big effect. Something else that they can do that would be protection. Now, a lot of people a lot of people go, what good is it if if the plant has to be eaten for the animal to figure out that it's toxic, right? Doesn't really do much for the original plant, does it? However, let's just say we're grass. We're all grass. We're probably genetically identical because the very first seed right here sent shoots up and sent rhizomes out and then we all grew from those rhizomes. So we're all identical twins, all right? However, we contain toxins in our central vacuole. Unfortunately, sorry, someone came along and ate you and got sick and went, wait a minute, I'm not sure I want to eat that plant again. Protects the rest of us. Aren't we genetically identical to him? So in fact, he is protecting himself, or at least protecting his genes. So that's kind of how it works. So usually the ones that get eaten don't get the benefit, but their relatives do. All right, and lastly, growth. Now imagine if we want to make this room bigger, but we only have a certain amount of air to fill it. Or let, okay, let's just say it's a pool. We're inside of a pool. We're, it's full, right? But we only have so much water, right? We're going to make the pool bigger, but we only have so much water, right? We want the same depth, so what do we do? We fill the middle of the pool with a big space, right? So the same amount of water fills the same amount of space, but we have this extra hole there. That's what's happening. As the cells get bigger, instead of having to rebuild new cytoplasm to fill that extra space, they just make a hole and surround it with membrane. All they have to do is make more membrane rather than make more cytoplasm, which is very expensive, right? It's all proteins and all kinds of other stuff. So instead of just making more, they just make that central vacuole expand and you can fill a larger cell with the same amount of cytoplasm. Phospholipid. Pretty much. There would be a little bit of protein involved in it, but cytoplasm is much more complex and would be much more energy consuming. I wasn't sure if it had protein. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff in the cytoplasm where it would be, it would cost a lot more energy to make that. Why would the cell want to expand? Just get larger. Cells just get larger. Um, when we do the microscope, you'll actually see, like on the plant cells, when they divide, they're small, and then as you look up the, the root, they're much larger. So just the mere, the mere act of, of growth. All right, moving right along. So, I mean, take a look. This is the model, but I mean, this is actually an, a micrograph of a plant cell. Look how big that central vacuole is. We're looking at like a third of the plant cell is just empty space. Now, is it truly empty space? No, but it looks like it is. All right, so far so good. Now the last two are the coolest ones. Now, these aren't the last two, but the next two, I should say. <clears throat> now, to be part of the endomembrane system, you have to be in that chain of events, right? Nucleus to the ER, ER to the Golgi, Golgi to whatever their final destination means. It could also be the cell membrane, right? Because membrane is membrane and so on. These two organelles are membrane bound, all right? Both say they have membranes present, but they're not part of the endomembrane system because they're not part of that process. They're not about uh, protein synthesis and distribution. So we say that they're separate, but these things are cool, folks. They each have their own DNA. Think about that. That'd be like having a car that had an engine in the back seat, in addition to the one under the hood. The one in the back seat powers the stereo. Talk about some serious tunage, right? Get your own gas-powered engine in the back seat, running your stereo. Thousand watts out of the back seat. 
100,000 watts out of the back seat. It would actually shoot the windshield out of the car when you turned it up. I mean, wouldn't that be some serious, serious, uh, same idea here. They have their own DNA. And in fact, they are capable of replicating themselves. Think about that. Everything else has to be replicated as part of the cell. They replicate themselves by fission. Hmm, interesting. Now, let's take a look at the mitochondria. The mitochondria, as I said, contains a, it's a double membrane structure, meaning it's got an outer membrane and it's got an inner membrane made of cristae, which are folds. this. And in fact, I'm not even doing it justice. The folds are much more complex than that. But it's got two membranes. So we say this is outside. This is the outer membrane. This is the intermembrane space, the space between the membranes, the inner membrane, and then this is the matrix. It has nothing to do with Keanu Reeves, but that's the matrix. All right. So in the folds, we call the cristae. And on the folds, all over here, are a number of enzymes. And when we talk about, in unit three, the next unit after this one, we're going to talk about what those enzymes do. Okay? <clears throat> but if you look at the bottom, it kind of lets the cat out of the bag. The inner membrane contains, now they're actually embedded in the membrane itself, contains enzymes involved in cellular respiration, particularly the citric acid or the Krebs cycle, and electron transport. Basically means mitochondria are the primary organelles for energy transformation. They are the engines of the cell. Now, can cells survive without mitochondria? Bacteria can. But let me tell you this much. If you start with one molecule of glucose and give it to a bacteria, they'll make two ATPs from it. You give one molecule of glucose to one of our cells that contain mitochondria, instead of two, they make 38 ATPs from it, or at least can. Can you see that there's a bit of an advantage using the mitochondria? Yeah, those two pathways are where the extra, DNA, or where the extra ATP comes from. So, Mitochondria are energy transformers, not energy creators. They're energy transformers. It's like a car. Does a car create energy? No. It takes fuel and converts it into a form of energy that we can use for powering a vehicle. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so, all right. So they are the energy transformers, they are the engines, they are the fuel. It's kind of like a furnace. You put fuel in, you get something out. And, the, and basically what we're saying is that it's ATP. And we use ATP to power a lot of our reactions. And we're going to talk about, like I said, in Unit 3 when we look at metabolism. All right. So, you notice anything strange up there? They have their own ribosomes. Why would an organelle require its own ribosomes? Why would an organelle require its own DNA? Why would it need to multiply? Good answer. Stay alive. Stay alive. But it's already inside one of our cells. It could. The belief is this. This was once a free-living organism. Why not? It has its own DNA, it has its own ribosomes, it has its own membrane. If we would take a bacterial cell into our cell right now, what would it look like? It would look like an E. coli with a membrane around the outside, right? A vesicle. Two membranes, two membranes. The hypothesis is that this was once a free-living organism that somehow got entrapped in a 
early eukaryotic cell, and the combination of the two was so good that they kept it. Now, I'm sure you're probably going, that sounds really far-fetched. However, I could go probably, how far could I, how fast could I get 300 feet? 10 seconds? Uh, probably not. That would be, <laughs> that would be a really fast 100 meter dash right there. But 300 feet, you know, you could probably get there at a slow walk in a minute. Within 300 feet, I could show you this exact same example happening. Anyone ever heard of a lichen? Anyone know what lichens are? They look kind of like a crusty, some people mistake them for moss. What is a lichen? A lichen is a fungus with an algae growing inside of it. The fungus gives the algae a place to stay so the algae doesn't have to live in water, and the algae is photosynthetic and feeds the fungus. It's a symbiotic relationship. This, we believe, is a symbiotic relationship, and this has just lost its ability to live on its own. Cool, huh? That's why I say these are far out. These are, these are just like, they got their own DNA, they got their own ribosomes, they recreate themselves, they are the great energy transformers, and possibly they were once a free-living bacteria. And by the way, you look at their DNA, and it's more like bacterial DNA than ours. But they've been around so long that there's actually been exchange between nuclear DNA and the, and the ribos, and the uh, mitochondria, so things have gotten kind of mixed up. Isn't that neat? Isn't that kind of a bizarre idea? Oh, and by the way, how many of you know a really serious dyed-in-the-wool chauvinist? The kind that, you know, women are only out there to serve men, and men are God's gift? <laughs> we all know somebody like that, right? You could probably, you don't have to give me a name, but you, you could probably name one, right? If you ever want to knock them off their pedestal just a little bit, ask them about their pink mitochondria. So no matter how masculine they are, they are composed of 100% female mitochondria. There is no such thing as a male mitochondria. And the reason is, during reproduction, oops, during reproduction, here's the sperm cell, here's the neck, and here's the tail. This is the only place where there are mitochondria in a sperm cell. This is the only part that fertilizes the egg. So the only mitochondria that you have, you receive from your mother. Which means we have one gender mitochondria. Because whatever it is, you got from your mom. So if you're gonna just knock them off. I know, it's a really big insult. You've got female mitochondria. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a stabber, that's just a... <laughs> that, that's really just cutting them to the quick, right? So anyway, but yeah, and that's why you can't do genetic testing to track a male line in a family, because you can't. It disappears every generation. You can track the mother's lineage back a long time if you look at mitochondrial DNA. In fact, mitochondrial DNA is so cool that the FBI has their own mitochondrial DNA lab at the state crime lab. And it's, the state, it's actually the upper section which includes like Minnesota over to Montana. So all tissue samples that are being looked at with mitochondrial DNA get sent to St. Paul, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> now, the other of the cool organelles is the chloroplast. And by the way, I'll let, you, I'll let the cat out of the bag early. This falls into the same category. It's got its own DNA. It's got multiple membranes. It's got uh, its ability to reproduce itself. Same thing. This is believed to have been a photosynthetic bacterium that was incorporated into a eukaryotic cell, and we now have plants. Because there are bacteria that, that behave just like chloroplast. Now, if you ever took a botany class, you would come across the word plast or plastid quite regularly. These are, these are kind of generic um, organelles found in plants, and the prefix just tells you what the purpose is. Like a chloroplast contains chlorophyll, which means they're green and are associated with photosynthesis. A chromoplast would be something that contained other types of pigments, other colors. An ameloplast contains amylose. Anybody know what amylose is? Starch. 
We will see amyloplasts when we look at uh, potato cells stained with iodine. We'll see little pebbles that look like, they just look like black grapes. But they contain, so a plastid is a plant, kind of a generic plant vesicle. All right, so the purpose of chloroplasts, however, is they contain the green pigment chlorophyll. Now, a lot of people say, well, plants photosynthesize, animals respire. That's not necessarily true. Or it, it is true, but they're not opposites. The better way to say it is plants photosynthesize, animals eat. And once they both get food into the system, they both respire. Okay? So, the chloroplast has these pigments in it which means it can take sunlight and convert it into another form of chemical energy and use it to build sugars. That's where our sugars come from. That's why we get sugar, we get sucrose from sugar cane. That's why we get sucrose from sugar beets. That's why we get fructose from corn. Because these plants can make sugar using sunlight as the source of energy. Okay? Now, in the case of chloroplasts, instead of it looking like this, they have a three membrane system. You've got an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then what are called the thylakoid membranes, which are stacks like this that are connected. But you can see there's three different locations, right? There's the inner membrane space. We call this the stroma, the, the sto <coughs> stroma. And then you've got the thylakoid membrane space inside. So, again, lots of chambers, and when you have lots of chambers, you have places where things can occur. And the same processes that go on here go on, are similar to the ones that go inside of a mitochondria. So, it's actually some pretty neat stuff, some pretty complex reactions. I mean, the, the, um, one of the most complex that I've ever seen, and I taught biochemistry, was the regeneration step in photosynthesis to regenerate ribulose. It's incredible. Now, it seems like a really easy math equation, right? You start off with three, five carbon molecules. Wait a minute. Oh, I got the other way around. Sorry. You start off with five, three carbon molecules, and you wind up with three, five carbon molecules. That doesn't sound too hard, does it? It's 15 carbons, it's just reshuffling. But obviously, nothing, you, you can't combine them, right? You combine two and you get six. How do you get five? Combine two and cut one off? No, that's not how it works. So it's a really complex process, but it's going on in these chloroplasts. And if it wasn't for this process, we wouldn't have sugars and we wouldn't have, what else? Do you know what else they make? That would be another food molecule, but it's something that's even more important to us. Oxygen. The byproduct, their waste product of photosynthesis is oxygen. Think about that. Without, without photosynthesis, we wouldn't have it. So obviously these had to come first and then the oxygen breathers came along after that. All right, so any questions? So that's what the chloroplast looks like. You got the two outer membranes, the outer inner and then the thylakoid membrane system. And these are all connected so that inside of these are also isolated from the space, the thylakoid space, the stroma space, actually. Okay? And again, these are true color. So if you see under a microscope, you will see little green pebbles moving around inside of a plant cell. It's like red blood cells have true color, chloroplasts have true color, some chromoplasts have true color, but most everything else in cells are transparent. And lastly, this is another, um, another membrane-bound structure. It's similar to a lysosome, but lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. Peroxisomes contain enzymes for detoxifying peroxides. And peroxide, if you remember from chemistry, is H2O2. It's a byproduct of lipid metabolism. And we metabolize lipids all the time. So we're constantly producing peroxide. And peroxide is very toxic. It's one of the big three toxins in our body. The three, probably the three biggest toxins are peroxides, superoxides, and hydroxy radicals. 
Have you ever heard of drugs called antioxidants? They are to fight those chemicals. Those are the oxidants, the oxidizers. I describe them as a bull in the china shop, right? They're going to destroy anything they run into. Pretty much the same thing with the oxidants. Those are three toxins that occur just because we live in an oxygen environment. Oxygen is actually a poison, but we have enzymes to take care of it. Like peroxidase. We find peroxidase in peroxisomes. Guess what? We'll be working with peroxidase in lab. It's actually not our peroxidase, but another, another type of peroxidase, but it's still there. Still the same thing. So, not only does it break down lipids, but it also breaks down the toxins that are occur that occur because we broke down the lipids. So, that's what the peroxisome is for. It's a pretty simple reaction too. It just it converts it converts um, peroxide to water. And like I guess, structurally, there's not much too they're not too exciting. Now I'm going to stop right here. This is where we left off this morning. But one thing I want you to review when you're doing this is the cytoskeleton. Let me just tell you this: when I like, when I was in your seat, this was there was very little known about this. We thought the cytoplasm was more like broth in a soup, right? Almost a liquid, maybe a gel. Well, it turns out most of the internal structure in the cell is solid. It's a skeleton. There's actually fibers connecting these structures together. And this is probably one of the areas that has developed the most in the time since I was in this class. So look at them, microtubules, filaments, and intermediate filaments are similar, but they're definitely, they definitely have their own characteristics. All right, so look at that. We'll come back and touch on this on um, Wednesday. Any questions? Do you, uh, let me take a, do, you have a test. do you haven't picked up your test yet, you can pick it up.